And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Inside Twins. It's brought to you by Killebrew Root Beer, locally owned and operated. It's how memories are created and legends are made. I'm Corey Provis here from Target Field. A big hello to all of you listening today on the Treasure Island Baseball Network and watching us as well on uh, many of our twin social media platforms. We are grateful that you're joining us today, however you are, on this Sunday throughout Twins territory. Twins and the Royals one last time wrapping up this four-game series here today. Twins won the first two, fell a run shy yesterday, and today will play the 10th and final game on this long homestand. So far, the Twins are 5-4. and four. Good pitching matchup today to right-hitter Sonny Gray with the lowest ERA in the game. At .62 is on the mound for the Twins against right-hander Brady Singer. 2-2 two and two ERA, surprisingly, for a guy that came off such a great year last year is over six. Our guest on our Sunday show today is Twins General Manager Thad Levine. Always a treat to be joined by you, Thad. Thanks for stopping by. It's my pleasure. Pleasure to be on. Hope everyone's doing great. Yeah, we are excited to have you today. A lot to get to on the show today. Let's begin, if we can, with, with Sonny and the start that he is off to. He's 3-0. As I said, the lowest ERA in the game. What's different about Sonny at the start of 2023, Thad, that wasn't there at the beginning of 2022? You know, I think when when he joined us uh, after the the trade, he came into camp a little bit last year, probably not quite as far along as he was this year. He had a tremendous off season this off season, uh, came in uh, in in terrific shape. I think the other thing to note about Sonny, having had a conversation with him while we were down in Fort Myers, is how energized he was about the starting rotation, and he was talking about how you know he was on some great rotations in Cincinnati, and he said at their best. They were learning from each other. They were pushing each other. They were competing with each other. And he said that that kind of galvanization had taken place in, in this group. And so I think he feels as if he's learning things and he's getting pushed by his fellow starters. They're, they're watching each of their, their bullpens throughout spring training, throughout the major league season. I think they're all elevating one another's play right now. How much with, with Sonny, too, being the veteran that he is, was maybe caught off guard that the season began as quickly as it did. You know, maybe in conversations with, you know, members of, of the players' executive committee, the, the Scherzers and, and that whole group, that may be surprised that things expedited and the season picked up as quickly as it did. You know, I think the, the reality is I think that that applied to so many of the players last offseason. Uh, you know, we were just not as in concert with them in terms of offseason programming. Uh, they weren't allowed to to be integrated with the, with the major league teams at the major league spring training facilities, and I think for guys who had made that part of their routines throughout their careers, you know they tried to replicate it as best they could away from uh, the spring training facilities. But for fans' knowledge, once the calendar turns to January, we start having a ton of our major league players show up in Fort Myers. They start working out there on a daily basis. They get a, about a six to eight week of uh, uh, run into spring training where their their routines are really on point and they're really uh, gearing up to hit the ground sprinting in spring training. They really weren't afforded that luxury last year. So I think you're seeing more of a return to form for guys like Sonny Gray uh, this season. And the start, the start to the year has been absolutely exceptional. Yeah, the starting pitching certainly has been the strength, uh, Thad, with his team after now 28 games. But for the first time, you know, hit with some injury here lately, with uh, Kent Maeda on the IL, Bailey Ober took his spot. He's made two really good starts. And Tyler Malley right now, Thad, as we look ahead to the upcoming series in Chicago, Joe Ryan listed Tuesday, and Malley is still listed to start on Wednesday. As we sit here today, will that happen? So, you know, I, I, I think just to, to take a bit of a bird's-eye view on this, like when we one of the things we really were focused on this offseason and building out this team was just always add another layer of depth wherever we could. Um, we, we ended up starting the season with multiple starting pitchers at AAA that we thought were major league caliber starting pitchers. And, and I think that was very intentional and very purposeful when we, when we did that. I, it was a very difficult conversation with guys like Louis Varland and, and Bailey over at the end of spring when we told them they were going to start at AAA. And if there's a silver lining to what transpired last year with all of our injuries – was the fact that we got to see those guys up in the big leagues as much as we did. They got their feet wet. Uh, we got an understanding of where they stood in terms of the next line of defense. So we've gone to Bailey Ober already. We've gone to Louis Varland already. We've gone to Simeon Woods Richardson already. We're going to continue to have to do those sorts of things. Right now, uh, Ober you know, fits seamlessly into our rotation, picked up right where Kent Maeda would have left off, gave us a quality start yesterday. And yet to be determined on, on Tyler Malley. We're going to continue to evaluate and review where he is. The beauty of having tomorrow as an off day is it gives us a little more flexibility. 
Uh, if need be, you know, what we did earlier in this uh, season is we skipped uh, Ken to Maeda on a start. We have the flexibility to do that again if we so desire and still keep everyone else on turn. So we have some flexibility going into the Chicago series, but we should have a lot more information on Tyler uh, when we talk to the doctors later today. When Malley was healthy, he was a part of the consistent length that the Twins, you know, were getting from the staff for the most part this season, you know, leading all of baseball for a large chunk of April in getting length from their starting staff which wasn't a strength last year. What, what has changed? Yes, there are some new faces, but what has changed? Is it, is, it, is it planning? Is it philosophical? I mean, how do you break that down, why the starting staff has been maybe even allowed to pitch a bit deeper into the games than they were last year? I, I mean, I think a lot has been made of the analytics that go into decision-making around starting pitching and, and the relief core and how they're utilized. In the last uh, last year, we, we had the personnel that lent itself that we were going to lean into our bullpen a little bit more. We liked those matchups as the, as the game went along. I think it's different this year, and I think we're showing our versatility and flexibility to recognize we're going to still stay true to the analytics and be grounded in those. Those analytics are a little bit more favorable to the starting pitching uh, this year, and I don't want to say anything negative about last year's staff. I'll just simply say – qualitatively one through five and now we're going to look at it one through six with Ober and potentially down the road one through seven with with Varland we just feel that qualitatively that is a the strength of this team is in the starting rotation we love what the bullpen's been able to do and complement those guys but we're willing to push those guys a little bit more because the matchups are just more favorable in response to the fact that the quality of their pitches really are are excellent and it's played out that way so far yeah, I'm glad you brought up the bullpen because we we saw this play out late yesterday a great stat that we discovered uh, during the game actually from Dave Holtzman, uh, who works uh, on, on the uh, Royals television side of things. The Twins pitchers entering the game yesterday, a leadoff walk only came around 5% of the time, and that was the second lowest ratio of any staff in the game. But then you look at how the game ended yesterday, and for the first time, those dreaded leadoff walks came back to bite the Twins in a one-run loss. Well, you know, I, I don't know if this is something we're going to talk about in the show, but the proliferation of stolen bases so yes. far this season and the, how we've seen that grow. And I would tell you, at the epicenter of that conversation in the Kansas City Royals. So when you're talking about how we've been able to suppress leadoff walks, period, but certainly those leading to runs, it's extremely difficult to do that against a team like the Kansas City Royals. We saw it yesterday. Walks turned into doubles. The, 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 almost everyone on their team, with very few exceptions, uh, can can steal bases and put a lot of pressure on your your defense. So those things are really magnified against teams that either a can really slug and you know you're you're susceptible to extra base hits after those walks or teams that can steal bases. This team is a little bit more focused on the the base running and stealing than maybe the extra base hits, but that's where it came back to haunt us yesterday. Uh, we'll take our first break, come back, and we'll begin the next segment with the Twins running game. Really, the lack thereof yesterday, for example, the Royals stole four bases in that one game. The Twins, as a team, have stolen just three all year long. We'll try to dive into that. Also get some comments from Thad about some news on Byron Buxton that we heard from Rocco Baldelli that we addressed uh, throughout the broadcast yesterday. That and much more coming up as Inside Twins continues live from Target Field on your home for Twins baseball.
Welcome back to Inside Twins, brought to you by Killebrew Root Beer, locally owned and operated. It's how memories are created and legends are made. Corey Provis and Thad Levine back with you from Target Field. Twins and the Royals coming up at 110. This program takes you up to the pregame show with Chris at uh, the bottom of the hour. Thad, we left off the last segment talking about the running game, and we've seen the Royals do that plenty here the last couple of days. For the Twins, it hasn't been a strength. Only three stolen bases in six attempts all season long. And I'll, I'll set it up this way, that I, I didn't think the Twins were going to lead all of baseball in terms of stealing bases, even attempting stolen bases, but I am surprised that the team has not tried to run more. After seeing this now for a month, are you surprised only six stolen base attempts after nearly 30 games? I guess I would go back to the analogy of what we were just discussing on, on the pitching side of things. Is I, I just think it shows uh, Rocco, Jace Tangler, our, our coaching staff, the analytics, the, soup, the, the, the our advanced team's versatility. Like We analyze our personnel and we try to put our personnel in best position to succeed whether that's a decision about taking a starter out and bringing in a reliever or whether it's asking guys to, to run the bases and how they do it. I would say that there's two things that we really look at when it comes to base running. One is the easy stat to look at is stolen bases and stolen base percentage, and, and we know we're, we're not high in that list. But secondarily, we do look at, and you know, this is something fans could follow on a, a place like Fangraphs, it's a, it's a base running rate stat that you see and we're actually starting to climb the list there and and what you see in that is it's reflected on not only uh, stealing bases but it's going first to third it's going second to home on singles it's taking extra bases when the balls are in the dirt and quite frankly it's suppressing uh, double plays and and we're starting to climb the, the ladder there we were a little bit low to start the season there probably an area we were a little bit more focused on candidly than just the stolen bases because i think we look at it and know that our personnel isn't necessarily put in the best position asking them to steal a lot of bases, but we do expect them to go first to third. We do expect them to score from second on singles, and we, we, we want to suppress double plays as best we can. So I would say from a fan base standpoint, for the way our roster is configured right now, that's probably a stat that I would be a little bit more attentive to than just stolen bases on their own. All right, so I, I was asking Carlos Correa late last year about, about stealing bases, and he said, no, nah, it's not for me. It hasn't been for a long time. Uh, the history with the ankle, and he also brought up the analytical side of it, the risk versus the reward. But what, I, what I'm seeing in a trend today in the game is MLB releases these, uh, these updates with how teams are adjusting with the pitch timer and violations and the stolen base rate. It's an 80% success rate right now across the game, which is up about 5 or 6% alone from last year. So based on that, is it still viewed in the same context that, no, it's, it's too risky, but now eight out of ten times that that runner is, is successful, shouldn't that outweigh the, the risk side of the argument? I, I think that's a well above average question. I would, I would rate that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, here, here's, the, here's a very interesting statistic that we, we track all the time. Like, of course, the, the, the central goal is to score runs with the idea in mind that, the team that scores the more the most runs that night is going to win. And so very simplified, what we try to do is correlate every single offensive or defensive or pitching-related outcome to how is it impacting either suppressing or enhancing the run-scoring environment. And the thing that we – honestly, I couldn't tell you exactly why this is the case, but stolen bases over the last five years, inclusive of this year, has not had a positive correlation to scoring runs. So the things that really impact scoring runs on a very, very highly correlated basis – slugging percentage, WOBA, on-base percentage. Uh, those, those things really drive that, that conversation a lot more than stolen bases. So that's not to say that we're going to turn a blind eye to the value of stolen bases. We saw it yesterday against us uh, with the Kansas City Royals and how they were able to manufacture runs. But by and large, over the course of a season, even in this enhanced running environment, we're not seeing a, an enhanced correlation between stolen bases and scoring runs. All right, that's interesting uh, data right there. I, I mentioned the name Byron Buxton before we went to our last break, and I want to go back to a comment uh, that we that we spoke of with Rocco on the pregame show yesterday as uh, my fine camera here just uh, fell down. So this is live streaming here, and oh, now yeah. your camera's <laughs> falling down. So this is the beauty of these uh, live streams here. All right, and now we're off and running. There we go. Hi, everybody. But uh, with, with Buxton, I asked Rocco on the show yesterday, and I'm going to play the comment here momentarily, and I want you to take a listen to it if you can. But here was the question for Rocco. Is Byron any closer to playing center field today 
than he was when the season started. Here's Rocco from yesterday. Now I would say no. I think he's going to continue to be our full-time DH, and we're going to keep him on the field. We're going to keep him feeling good. I really don't want to do anything that puts him in a position where he's going to miss more games and he's just going to be out of the lineup more. And I think still at this point, uh, if we were to send him out, he would have to get a lot of work in pregame because he hasn't been you know, out there in the outfield and shagging and running around and getting that workload on his body and on his, on his legs because we're trying to get him ready to play every day. We're trying to keep him in the lineup. And he's been swinging the bat real good. So the best way, I think, for us to keep him out there is to just continue to DH him and, and, and continue to see how he does and how he feels and how he recovers as the season goes on. All right, last nine games, Byron Buxton at the plate, 10 hits, four home runs, four doubles. He's knocked in eight, slugging over 740. So so the plan is it working based on how you thought this would go with Byron as the primary DH to begin the year? You know, I would tell you and the fans that, you know, this is this is a best laid plan, but we don't have empirical data to say this is going to be perfect. So the goal here, as, as clearly stated, is we want to get Byron in the in the lineup as much as we possibly can this year. We truly believe, we truly know we're a better team when he's on the field uh, than when he's not. And that, that's played out over every single year of his career where the team has performed significantly better when he's been active and playing than when he's been inactive or not playing. So one of the, the, the routes we took this year is we were going to minimize the defensive wear and tear on his body, especially early in the year. Uh, when the weather wasn't uh, favorable, and unfortunately this April has certainly played out that way. And then we decided in, in spring training we were going to kind of review it in May when the weather turned and started becoming more positive. I think that's the part of the schedule we're at. Ideally, Mother Nature will start complying and it will become a little bit warmer. But until it does, our, our intent is to try to keep him in the lineup as much as we can as a DH. Ultimately, those decisions are up to uh, really a trio of people, and it's not me or, or Derek per se. It's, it's really Rocco, it's our medical staff, and it's Byron. So... Right now, we definitely think it's working well. He's been playing at a higher clip than he normally had uh, throughout the course of his career. We have been able to keep him on the field uh, during the, the, the most part of the inclement weather part of our season. Uh, the weather's hopefully increasing and improving. That will hopefully give us more opportunities to consider him in the outfield. But I echo what Rocco said. Like We're going to be extremely thoughtful about that transition because right now he's just so vital to our team uh, in the lineup. Uh, ideally, at some point, he's playing defense again. But when that is, is going to be yet to be determined. And in the meantime, we're going to celebrate each and every day that he's in the lineup. All right, so just to follow up before we take our last break on that topic. So the Twins hired a new head athletic trainer, Nick Paparesta. When it's all said and done, is he the guy, though, Thad, that will say to Byron, hey, we've done this now, you're cleared to go out and at least begin doing some pregame work, whether that's shagging during BP or Tommy Watkins takes him out with a fungal bat. Does it start with the head trainer and Nick Pop rested to let Byron know, hey, let's go get some work in in center field? Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to, Corey, is it's really a team of people. Nick Nick will have a, a loud voice at that table, but so too are our major league coaching staff. So too are the rest of our performance team on the strength and conditioning side. They're very familiar with the the you know we test our players constantly to understand where they are physically, and we want to put Byron in the best position to succeed, the team in the best position to succeed. So there are a lot of people who will weigh into those decisions. We'll be very thoughtful about the conversation there and make sure we're putting uh, Byron ideally in the best position to stay healthy, and if he's healthy, great things will happen. All right, we'll take our last break, come back, and wrap up our Sunday show. Have a thought or two about Alex Kirilov, who's doing great at AAA. We'll talk about Kirilov and more next. Inside Twins concludes in a moment on your home for Twins Baseball.
Welcome back to our final segment of Inside Twins. It's brought to you by Killebrew Root Beer, locally owned and operated. It's how memories are created and legends are made. Corey Probe is back with Thad Levine. One last segment. Your questions are coming up here for Thad momentarily. But I want to bring up the name Thad Alex Kirloff, who is on a 20-day rehab assignment. And day 20, correct me if I'm wrong, is today. So Kirloff, the numbers look great. So what is next for the former first-round pick? Yeah, you know, I think I think we talked uh, two segments ago about the depth we have on the starting rotation side, and we've seen three of them already come up. And Kirloff is one of these guys who uh, I think we see similarly on the offensive side. And the blessing of the team and how it's currently constituted is we've got more major league caliber players than we have major league caliber uh, roster spots. So I think Kirloff has done so well on his rehab assignment. It's been so encouraging to see him swing the bat. We think he has a really advanced field to hit. He's been very, very promising. Uh, we've got a decision to make up upcoming. The good news is we've got a lot of guys performing at the big league level as well. So that, that decision will be made here in a timely fashion, something we'll sit down after the game, uh, discuss with Rocco, and see what our plans are moving forward. He has one option left, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Kirloff, that is correct, one yes. option left. Okay. All right, so that's something to keep in mind. Let's uh, take some questions now. Let's uh, go to International Falls. Alex is uh, checking in today on our social media platform, and he is asking about – adjustments that were made for Jorge Lopez in the offseason that has made him so successful against lefties and others to begin his season. So I'll, I'll interest, answer this one a little bit interestingly, Alex. I think what actually transpired when we acquired uh, Jorge last year, he was dominant uh, in his time in Baltimore. And I think what we saw when he came here was a little bit of a, a change. And now he's returning to that level of dominance. And boy, has he gotten off to an excellent start so far. Really, our whole bullpen has, but really headlined by Jorge. And so I think what you, what fans may not understand is these guys are human beings. And so when, when you're acquired in a trade, I think you sometimes try to be more than what you had been uh, because you want to deliver exceptional value to the team that acquired you, especially when we were in a playoff race at the time. So I think if you talk to Jorge, what you would find is he actually deviated a little bit from his plan that he had in Baltimore when he came here and tried to be a little bit more than what he had been in Baltimore, which was one of the most dominant uh, relievers in the American League. He's returned to form there. And what what is so unique about Jorge is he's got a, a starting pitcher's mix. He's going out there with four pitches, so he has weapons uh, against lefties. He's been pitching ahead the whole the whole season, but I think more than anything, he's regained his confidence, he's regained his identity, uh, and he's letting the, the exceptional pitch qualities play. So not a lot of changes that we've made. We've tried to just bring him back to who he was in Baltimore when he was excellent, and he's really embraced it. All right, quickly here, Diane in uh, Watertown, South Dakota, is asking us to say, asking you, please extend Sonny Gray's contract and Thank you. Your thoughts? <laughs> I, uh, and first of all, like great, great thought. Um, you know, we were very aware going into this season that we had three starting pitchers who were going to matriculate to free agency. Our goal was to not let that happen. We have a few means to do that. Uh, I would just tell you this: like we've had some conversations with guys in spring training. We'll continue to have some conversations. Uh, couldn't be more happy for what Sonny has done so far this year. We're thinking a lot along right with you, Diane, on that one. All right, great question. Thank you all for the questions, and that was a fast half hour of talking twins. So, uh, Thad, thanks for the time. Enjoy Thank the you game to today. For, uh, for listening. All right, that's Thad Levine, our guest here on our Sunday show. We are just getting started. Much more to come. Chris is up next, today's pregame show, and then we'll have game four at 110. Twins and the Royals coming up. Said four minutes. You said four. <laughs>